the title of the message is A Holy Echo. And it was super serious in our trustee meeting when I was sharing it until John started saying, I would say a holy echo and he would say a holy echo and <laughs> kind of kind of uh, got in the way of what I was trying to say, John Jono and family are on vacation and John and Nell and kids and Danielle and family are on vacation. Jamie's was away. I'm so glad she got to get to got to get away and she's uh, getting some good rest, I hope and pray and. And um, anyway, so an idea that's worth repeating, a message that's worth repeating. And as I had this in my heart, I don't even remember why or how or what, but I was reading Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 6 through 11, which I'm going to read with you. So I believe when we come together as a church, especially with what we just have seen yesterday and just in general, that these are moments where we come together and we learn together. Can we say amen to that? It doesn't, doesn't need to blow your mind. It just needs to be some things that we grow together in Jesus. Um, we don't put a premium on Sunday mornings, 20 minutes, and that's our Christian life. The premium is on a, us being a church family. And um, sometimes, this is an aside, sometimes people want something from, to be fed a certain type of way in churches uh, and they turn into consumers. And God has called us to not just consume, but to give. And so the idea isn't, what has my church done for me lately? It's, how can I be part of what God's doing in a church family? Amen? Um, so what, what is in my life worth re repeating? And this was just so, it's like a personal thing, Lord. What do, I, what do I do that I want to see done again? Or what's the concepts that are bubbling up here at Castle Church that I think would be worth repeating elsewhere. And part of that stirring was when I was on this trip with Telos, um, a, an organization that takes Christian leaders through immersive experiences, and it's all involved with peacemaking. And um, But the, the tour of the, the first immers immersive experience took us through the Deep South. And when I'm away from you all, I think of you all, and I think of how what God is doing here could be done in another place. Um, but that's, you know, just kind of where I was at when I was thinking about this particular word. So in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, it says, So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him. This is after he's risen. They kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you? to free Israel and restore our kingdom? <laughs> Note the question. They kept asking him, okay, you're alive, you, you rose from the dead. All right, now do we do the kingdom? Our kingdom? Our positions? Our power? Our rule? Is it time for that now? And he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set the dates and the times and they are not for you to know. As a matter of fact, later what's revealed is they were entering in the time of the Gentiles. That's a phrase in Scripture, and it's really powerful because they were focused on their own kingdom, and he was saying the kingdom's a lot bigger than you think because God doesn't just play favorites. He's actually, he came into this world to save all who's, who call upon him, amen? I think that's a, probably a big idea for a second. It isn't just about one country. I love being an American, but it ain't just about being an American. Mm, that was kind of weak. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> I, I love being an American, but actually God's kingdom is far more and far greater, and we should thank God that it is, than our own country, amen? Amen. So you can do both. You can love your country, and but you should be kingdom-minded. It says this in verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you stand, standing here 
staring into heaven. Sometimes we get so spiritually minded, we miss the, the ground beneath our feet. And why are, you, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Uh, by the way, that hasn't happened yet. So guess what we have to look forward to? The day that Jesus one day returns. Can we say amen to that? Why don't we give another clap for Jesus, the fact that he's going to be coming back. Okay, so I told you I was thinking about replication. And then when I read this phrase, the ends of the earth, and I looked up the phrase, the ends of the earth, it carries the idea of an echo. So what happened in their lives should be echoed all across the world. And it's this beautiful picture of this original sound that isn't just duplicated, but it is beautifully and powerfully sent from the original source, from the original wave, this echo of a message that goes across and transcends cultures and peoples and times and goes on and on and on because it's so powerful and so transformative. This is the message that should go to the ends of the earth, and it's an echo. And do you know that the original sound of the echo that I'm describing here may be somewhat a little bit liter literarily is Jesus. Jesus is the original sound. And our lives should do what? Should echo who Jesus is. Amen? It's not a faint repetition, but it is a powerful carrying forward of the message of the gospel. I want you to take five seconds, five seconds to just thank Jesus for the gospel. I want you to think about the gospel. What? The gospel? The good news. Back in Roman times, when the word spread, it was called the good news of the emperor. This is good news of an, that's an emperor who died. This is good news of a king who still lives, who was sent to die on a cross for our sins, that we might be made whole. Not so that the message would become, here's the three steps to salvation. That might be part of a conversation, but our gospel, the gospel that transforms us, transforms us body, mind, and soul. One day, our best life is the next life. Can we say amen to that? The kingdom we're waiting for is actually now here, and it's in our hearts. And this is the echo that should be carrying on. We should have some reverb on the mic. Wouldn't that be so cool? No, that's a bad idea. That's why they don't always listen to me. His message, his hope, your life has an echo. Whether you like it or not, there's something about your life that is being repeated by at least one other person. Someone else is thinking about what you said and what you did and how you make them feel. Am I right? It's like those videos where you see the dad watching a football game, and he's cursing, and he's cursing at the game, and all of a sudden his little child starts cursing with him because there's an echo from the father to the son, amen? Or even a more positive light, it's the father who gets on his knees and prays, and when he looks up, his son is on his knees looking up and praying because our lives carry an echo. And I want to tell you what it should sound like a little bit, right? I want to I want to offer to you what this should sound like. What should your life sound like? The only way I can even get you there. Okay, so we go back to verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. So I'm trying to overlay carefully this scripture on top of our lives. And then top of Castle. What do I say here at Castle Church a lot? I, I'm going to keep repeating this one because I, I believe it's worth an echo. It's not just you. It's we, us, our. Amen? It's, it's a family. We are so individualistic. We try to take everything and make it about us. And he does love you specifically. But he put you in a family, in a community for a reason. Because he wants you to learn how to what? To love others. Because that's the echo. And... If I were to try to grasp and help you with this, you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. If you've been around church world long enough, 
a lot of times people will say this is like a strategy. Okay, first your city and then, then the outer areas and then even further until you get to the ends of the earth. And there's lots of ways to kind of look at that scripture and none of them are big problems or even big at the end all solutions. But I would suggest that maybe this whole sentence is weighted on Samaria. Because Samaria would be the thing that shocked the disciples. It reminds me of when Matthew was writing the gospel and he was writing the lineage of Christ. And in the lineage, he wrote about the women who came before him. And he wrote that in a patriarchal society. And he even must have been really shocked as he was writing down the lineage and put in there Rahab, Rahab, who was once the prostitute. And she is honored and dignified as part of the lineage, and it must have shocked that ironclad culture of people who are on different hierarchies. And it was so shocking, but Jesus was probably, you know, among other things, reminding them that in Christ is neither male nor female. We are going to believe in unity, is what he was saying, the unity of Christ. It's not the elevation and separation. It's us together united to bring this message of the gospel to the world. And where women were put down, Jesus was elevating them is the point. And it shocked them, just like Samaria did. Because Samaria, Samaria, I can't, I'm not that dramatic preacher, right? So, like, you're just going to have to get dramatized. I don't even know what that means, Miguel. But this Samaria, the disciples, first of all, just because Jesus is now ascending, don't, don't think that the disciples got it all sorted out now. They got a lot to learn still. How many of us have a lot to learn? And so he's saying Samaria to them, and they're like, oh, Samaria. You don't understand, church, you don't understand. Samaria? They couldn't stand Samaritans, the Jews, the, the people. Like the, there's these two groups of people couldn't stand each other. They had irreconcilable differences. It goes way back to when, like, Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls and the Samaritans came along and were, like, saying, trying to get in the way of that. And they started to separate. And the, Sam, Samaria? Samaria was the place where those who were excommunicated from the faith were sent to Samaria, and criminals sent to Samaria. So the other group of people really looked down on them, and then because of that, they hated each other. And there was so much division. Samaria, it was, it was actually pretty shocking. And if you want to know how bad it got, John chapter 8, verse 48, when they went to accuse Jesus... They said, Jesus, you are a Samaritan and therefore have a demon. You ever hear the, the phrase, they demonize others? Well, they did that to the Samaritans. They were no longer people. They were like demonic. It had gotten so bad, and I love Jesus' response. He said, well, I don't have a demon. But even though he wasn't a Samaritan, he didn't deny that. He was like, if you want to cut them down, all I know is I'm going to build them up. Okay, I'm trying to get you guys to understand the echo. You might try to cut them down, but I'm going to try to build them up. Because if the gospel is going to reach the ends of the earth, it better carry this sound with it. Samaria. 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 Because if Jesus is in your heart, Samaria should be on your mind. Because if Jesus is in your heart, people who are not like you should be on your mind. If Jesus is in your heart, those who have a different political background should be on your mind. Come on, church. Tell me we haven't demonized each other in politics. And this is the part where last night I'm like, can I just give you narrative? I don't usually like to give narrative of how I got a message because you guys don't need to know all that and all the personal wrestlings of my life. But last night I couldn't sleep. Can't you tell? Oh, Richie, I can always count on you. <laughs> to tell me like it is or like it isn't sometimes. 
Uh, but last night, I couldn't sleep. There was the situation yesterday. I know it's a euphemism. I'm just, you know, there was a situation yesterday. There was the shooting. It's at a political rally. And um, I, I write out a, I had this message, and I'm like, figuratively, just kind of ripping up the message, ripping up the message, ripping up the message. And like, but every time I did that in my mind, I kept feeling like the Lord said, I don't, you know, in my own personal faith, I feel like the Lord was saying, you already got the message. Like, this is, you got to tell people about Samaria. But I kept thinking about it. Do you know, this is the honest truth. I, as I was preparing this message earlier in the week, I had in my notes, because I was trying to get together this idea that there was a certain lieutenant governor in our country from North Carolina who stood inside a church who just said the most obnoxious thing about the need for killing of others. And I just remember thinking, I got to say something. I got to say something to church. And then I think of you all. And I actually think we have a really sweet, gentle, loving, kind church. We do. But I think it's still helpful to talk about these things. And I was really, um, I had that in my notes. Like, that's Christian nationalism to me in a nutshell, in a pulpit, demonizing others because they have a different political, they have a different religion. Just because they aren't Christian, you don't get a right to demonize people. I said that to Christians. <laughs> Just because you're, they're not Christian doesn't give you a right to demonize people. They said to Jesus, aren't you a Samaritan and have a devil? He said, well, I don't have a devil. But call me a Samaritan all you want because you might want to cut them down. I'm going to build them up. And I just kept, I like, it's hard to kind of break out of it, but I was thinking how um, really what the disciples were asking. They were saying, will, will your kingdom come now? Not, not your kingdom, sorry. They said, will our kingdom come now? And it says they kept asking. Jesus was so patient. Can we just thank Jesus for being so patient with us? I'm not preaching this because I've never, I've had my moments where I look at another and think that's an other. Lord, forgive me. And I bet you we all have. Can we be honest about that? Because ultimately, we don't always know everybody's stories. I've been teasing, I've been teasing Matthew. He's got a testimony. You've got a testimony. I'm 70% there, right? You're going to bring me to 100% of your story one day, bro. But I know you got a testimony. Give it up for Matthew. And there's a lot of talk. I heard another person say, I just wish it was like in the 60s. I want to go back to the 60s, and that's just not the time to go back to, people. You're missing a lot when you say that. In fact, you sound really ignorant. But if there are parents to the child of political violence, I think it's lying and boasting. I don't think sometimes we get it how bad and how deadly lies are. What's the ultimate lie? That someone else is not worthy of all of God's love. What's the ultimate lie? That there's anything less than we were all made in the image of God. Can we say a big amen to that? Amen. And anything less than that, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. Although it's a slippery slope when you take a political party on either side and say, because of this political party, the peop that's demonic. And then if the slippery slope is, then they're demonic. Not from this pulpit, not from this church. That's not happening. But there, but there was like this longing in them to go back to something. And Jesus pointed them towards something. And this message of the gospel was supposed to spread and be an echo. But the lying, any lying, can breed violence because it begins to diminish who we are made, who we are in God. Amen? Amen. I believe also boasting is apparent to political violence. When you boast, you elevate yourself, and you diminish others. When you boast, I have this worry in my heart. I'm just trying to 
I'm not saying I'm speaking even in a straight line. Can you guys all bear with me for a minute? Hopefully the spirit of what I'm saying. But I was thinking two more things on this before I move on. James 3.6 talks about the tongue. Smallest member of our body. We're a small member of our body. But it creates a big fire. Because what you speak, the rhetoric of what you say, can lead to the manifestation of acts of violence. Or the manifestation of what you say can lift people up and edify people. So I believe there's a reason why we end up with political violence and why we end up with, it's not just from zero to 100. There's a reason why we get to that speed. What we say, and God, there's a certain type of boasting. And one of my worries as I meet with Christian leaders and national leaders, uh, Christian leaders across the nation, is this idea of, of, of that type of environment as we get closer and closer to an election. But also I think about how mankind, uh, humankind is looking for political leaders to do the job of a Messiah when we have a Messiah that we should be worshiping. Mm. And Acts 12, 21 says, the, it's about Herod, King Herod. It says, when the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, throne and made a speech at a rally to them. And the people, I added at a rally because before that, it says with a crowd. And made a speech, and the people gave him a great ovation, shouting, it's the voice of a God, not a man. And King Herod died right after that. Um, our elevation as Christians, I, it's, it's our elevation as Christians. We can admire people, but don't worship them. Don't worship them. And my, my caution, because I can almost see it coming, is that the, there will be an increase of worshiping people, individuals, in these next couple of months. But church, Castle Church, we, us, our, we have one to worship. His name is Jesus. Keep him on the throne. Don't do it with other people. One of the best tests about Jesus in your heart is whether Samaria is there too. Okay? Samaria then represented the outsider. You guys all got me? Samaria. The outsider, the marginalized, the stranger. It's the Samaritan woman at the well who was like, don't even look at me. I'm ashamed. I had all these partners in the past. Many men I was with. And Jesus said, I'm about to deal with all the shame. And I don't care that you're Samaritan because I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. <laughs> and he met. It's, it's Samaritan back then was the leper that everybody didn't want to touch. It was the tax collector that people thought were patriotic traitors. It was the tax collector. I'm telling you, if we were hanging around with Samaria then and making it now, there would still be churches who kicked us out for the way that we hung out with people. Samaria now, it's the refugee. It's the immigrant. Person of a different race, religion, sexual orientation. It's people of all backgrounds. It's people who lived a life that you may not understand. And so to echo Christ in Samaria is to do what? Is to step outside of your comfort zones. To step outside of your comfort zones. It means recognizing the image of God in every single person. Maybe already you're starting to feel a little uncomfortable with a couple things I said, and that's fine. You can challenge things. That's how it should be when somebody preaches. But I don't think we should challenge this one particular phrase. I think this is fundamental. It means recognizing the image of God in every single person, regardless of their backgrounds or beliefs. Can we say amen to that? It's loving your neighbor as yourself. Our world has a different noise. It's hatred, it's division, and despair. Is that true or not? That's true, right? But amid all of this, what does God call the church to be? What's the echo? of our lives. It's supposed to be a beautiful harmony. It's supposed to be a chorus. 
your life and my life echoing the good news of the gospel that Jesus told the disciples back then, and it's still a message worth repeating. And it might be adapted to the different contours and spaces that we're in. There's a fresh expression of that gospel message, but there's an echo. And it comes from those who want to see the message of Christ, who laid down his life for others, brought to the ends of the earth. When we begin to change as Christians, this is the way we begin to change as Christians. It's when we begin to care like Christ. Why does some of this stuff even matter? You're saved, you're going to heaven. Because if you want to become more and more like Christ, more and more like Jesus, more and more like him, then you begin to care about the things he cared about. It's a different kingdom, church. It's not this political kingdom. The whole reason why I decided, Luis and I, after much prayer, took our own personal investment. There's a little bit of church support with the trips that we're making on Telus, um, an Uber ride, a plane ticket, that type of thing, which I'm really grateful for. But the bulk of it, Luis and I felt like it was time the right time for me to invest in this experience. And the thing that caught my attention the most was these a group of Christian leaders who are wrestling with what peacemaking means. And I would like to tell you and suggest to you that Christians, the echo of their lives, should be peacemaking and not division. Peacemaking, which pursues justice with an orientation towards healing and reconciliation that we're believing for healing and reconciliation. We're believing for the opposite of what division does. We're believing for peacemaking, that God, the difference between human, like just like a social justice and, and Christian justice. Christian justice believes not only for everybody, we're not just believing for people to get along, we're believing for mutual flourishing of even those who are not like us. When you want even your enemy to flourish, now you're getting into the realm of supernatural echoes that come from Jesus. And that's not easy. That's not easy. But when we begin to pursue these things, pursue justice, because we want people who are suffering injustice to know what God has called us into and healing, It begins to change us. Our hearts soften. How many people want softer hearts? We begin to promote justice and mercy and patience and gentleness and kindness, long-suffering and forgiveness. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Do you think your life has an echo to it because of what Jesus did on the cross? Finally, messages worth repeating are also worth suffering. Any message that's worth, worth it. Um, It's going to cost us at least our inconvenience. This word about witnessing has to do with, actually means it comes from a, a word, martyrdom, where the original disciples were laying down their lives for the message of the gospel. Um, we don't imminently face martyrdom as we stand here, sit here. Uh, We don't imminently face that. However, a good message, an internal message, is going to cause us to step outside of our comfort zone. Can we say amen to that? It's worth comfort. Comfort will choke the life. If we just always want to stay in Jerusalem and never worry about Samaria, your faith is going to shrivel up. It's going to have diminishing returns. Diminishing returns. If you just, if we as a church just think, I'm so grateful that we had snow cones and popcorn out here, yeah. down, downtown. <laughs> so grateful for that. But if we just think about the sidewalk out here and we miss like a month after we opened El Paso where people were shot and killed and we went and ministered there, we're going to have diminishing returns. We'll shrink to the size of our sidewalk. But God has called us with a holy echo to go further and further. And it doesn't mean all of us are going to go around the world, 
but collectively as part of a harmony and as part of what God is doing. We're bringing an eternal message to others because there isn't a more beautiful message than promoting who Jesus Christ is, our Lord and Savior, who makes us completely whole. Is that true? And so there is a part in our lives where God wants to give us, there's a, there's a verse, it's Psalm 118.5. This is when I was hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord, and he brought me into a spacious place. A spacious place, one commentary put it like this, it's like having elbow room. The echo is an extension, a message that goes further. Uh, God wants us to have more elbow room in our lives. We make room for other people. We're actually not just pursuing our own interests, but the interests of other people. How many people want that heart, even though you know you got a ways to go? It's making room for other people. And so we're, we're not believing for something to get smaller and smaller here at Castle Church. He has an echo that's coming out of downtown that is going around the corner where people need the love of Christ. And it's going, in my case, when I was on this bus ride that took me through New Orleans to Jackson to Selma to Montgomery. And you hear from people who just need to know the good news of Jesus Christ. There's an echo. And your life has an echo. Why don't we stand to our feet? If you can, and the musicians can come forward. So can I ask you, I want to ask you a question. Uh, first of all, there's a premise here that your life has an echo. So my question is, what gets echoed from your life today? How much of Christ is being echoed from your life? How much of him is what other people are picking up? And in the grand symphony of God's kingdom, our lives, there's only one you. Our lives are fine-tuned to the very sound of what Jesus wants to do right now in this time across across your home in your communities our city the city of Norwich has had its share of violence too you know how many people can be praying for the city when you come into this into this church and leave every time you got two prayers pray them twice as you come in and as you leave Lord I pray you'd move in Norwich Connecticut I don't know what to pray. Well, I just gave you two prayers. When you come in and when you go out. What Jesus was saying to the disciples is, I'm empowering you to do this. Because you won't just do it on your own flesh. You'll end up with people who think like you, look like you, act like you, and you will make a tribe. But my kingdom is not tribal. My kingdom is for all people of all backgrounds. My kingdom, if you're going to go through Jerusalem, they're probably like, yeah, the Jerusalem, the holy city. And then he said Judea, and he's like, yeah, we know Judea. I don't even need a map for that. I could tell you how to get around Judea. Samaria too. That's when they probably went, oh, you're going to just give me the same message now as you did before the cross? Samaria. They made they made fun of us. Do you know what they said about us? They don't do it the way that we do it. They're not like us. There are other people who have, they don't have the holiness we have. Jesus said, Samaria. Samaria, if it's going to echo, it has to sound like Samaria. Loud and clear, it has to sound like that. So we need to ask ourselves, how am I echoing Christ today? Am I reflecting his love in my relationships? How about this one? Am I sharing hope with people who are struggling? Do you know that you can, you sharing hope with someone else might share hope with someone else? That's an echo. Am I extending his healing to those who need healing? To the broken hearted? There are those who are broken who just need, they, they need the Christian sound. They need the sound of people who are willing to go to places 
and be with people who are not in their tribe and not in their political tribe. Church, we got about a couple of months before it happens in November, and, and that's kind of a subtext, but the main issue is the election will come and go, and people will come and go, and heroes will come and go. Don't worship them. Let's keep worshiping Jesus. And in these next couple of months, let's live out our faith. Bring hope to other people. Don't hold a grudge. Don't keep a, a, a track of, well, this side said this, and that side said this. There's going to be some issues you stand up for, and some of us are going to disagree on what those issues are. I understand that. But we should all be united that other people are also made in the image of God. And we also should be united that there's a message of forgiveness that we can bring and hope. And where are the peacemakers? Where are the people who say, I don't only just want my family to flourish, but I want my neighbors to flourish. I don't only just want my dreams to come true, but I want your dream to come true. I don't only just want the, the people I like to have a great time in life. I even want my enemies to flourish. And, and how that happens, there are ways that the Lord will empower you to do that day after day after day. But right now, we can make a choice. Say, so that's what I want from my life. This is what I want to be heard from my life. So can you bow your heads with me? And I just want to humbly present to you this idea that you can bring into this world this beautiful gospel message that Jesus empowered his disciples to do. And even when it tests you and it's hard and it's painful. But if you would like to be that echo, you don't have to say every single sentence that came out of my mouth was the thing you got to stand both feet on. But in essence, you want to live your life recognizing the image of God in other people and you want to be his messenger. And maybe as an aside, you need to receive Christ in your heart so that you can have that echo. Because maybe the only thing echoing from your life is the things of the world because you haven't surrendered yourself to him yet. Okay, church, if you want to cause, if you want to bring this hope in a greater and more meaningful and deeper way to others, as we're here, if that's you, you can raise your hand and just commit, commit that to Jesus. Say, Lord, I'm giving to you my life, my heart. I recognize that you've called me to sound different than this world. I give myself to you. And I pray that you would use me as an instrument in this world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship him now.
beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name. 